spoilers. Okay. Um, can you see my presentation? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. So, um, my name is Alexandra Szczepańska, and I have the pleasure of starting this presentation, which will be later continued by Sławek. And the title of our presentation, as uh, you already mentioned, is What do introductory linguistics textbooks have to say about language evolution? Um, to begin, the last three decades have been marked by a growing interest in language evolution, which, we, which is best exemplified by the emergence of two big conferences, Evolang and the one that we are taking part in now, um, Protolang, and also, for example, the emergence of the first journal dedicated to the topic. However, we still don't know to what extent the, the interest and the recognition of the importance of this topic have percolated down to other areas, such as the teaching of linguistics. And this is the issue that we addressed in our study. We started with three research questions. The first one was um, the we were interested in the topics, evidence and theories uh, related to language evolution that were discussed in introductory textbooks to linguistics. Uh, also, we were interested in the accuracy of their portrayal and whether there were some aspects that deserved more attention or better representation. The material for our analysis consisted of 18 textbooks to introductory linguistics, and these textbooks were taken from, um, from a list uh, from open syllabus. And then the, the content of these textbooks was coded in NVivo, which is an application used for the analysis of qualitative uh, data. There were two coders, Alexandra Poniewierska and myself, and we coded the material separately and then we, we compared our results. The approach that we adopted in the process of coding was a bottom-up approach, which meant that we're basically going through the, the content of the textbooks and when we found a passage that was related to language evolution, we, um, we created a new code. And at the end, we came up with 464 distinct codes. And as you can see, they were um, ordered in a kind of hierarchy. This is an example of one of the superordinate codes, language trained animals, which had its uh, daughter codes and the daughter codes had their own daughter codes and so on. Um, the, the topics that we were interested in and that we coded um, could be classified into uh, basic um, categories. Um, the topics related to animals, such as animal communication, animal versus human communication, and language trained animals. And the second category, which included topics talking explicitly about language evolution, and these were language evolution research, language origin theories, and um, also the names of researchers that uh, study language evolution. Now I would like to show you a short video that shows a chart created in R. Um, just to show you how finely grained the, the final result of our coding was. All right, and uh, the preliminary findings show that in three out of 18 textbooks, there was no reference whatsoever to either animal communication or language evolution. There were only three textbooks that contain a chapter on animal communication, and uh, there was only one textbook that contained a chapter on language evolution, and it was the study of language by George Yule. We also found a great discrepancy between the coverage of the topics related to animals and the topics related to language evolution. And as you can see in this chart, the topics related to animals were mentioned, discussed uh, four times more frequently than the topics related to language evolution. 
We also found that there were five main topics, which were animal communication, animal versus human communication, language trained animals, and they were followed by language evolution research and language origin theories. So as you can see, the three most frequently um, discussed topics were all related to animal communication rather than language ev evolution per se. What we also found was a great variability in the overall frequency of the coverage of, of the topics across the, the 18 textbooks. Um, and also um, within the code of animal versus human communication, when we look at the number of textbooks that mention certain um, daughter codes, we could see that the, the main topics were species specific and Hawkins design features. But then when we looked at the number of uh, references in all of the textbooks, we could see that there was just one dominant code that dwarfed other ones. And this was Hawkins design features. And now I would like to uh, give the floor over to Swavek. Okay, hello everyone, and I hope that you can hear me and see me. Yes. All right, and I'm about to share my screen, which I hope now you are also capable of seeing. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Alexandra. So Alexandra and Alexandra did all of the hard work, and now is uh, it's my part and, uh, and um, myself and Michael, our task to do, uh, our task is to do some evaluations. So uh, when it comes to, this is preliminary data still, but uh, our data is mostly complete. So the final results will be will likely be the same. Uh, all right, so again, the, the, the two main categories were animal communication and language evolution and origins research. For animal communication, we, all right, yes. Um, we found that it was, organized in almost all of the textbooks around Hockey's design features. And now some textbooks mention Hockey directly. Some textbooks mention design features and some textbooks just use the features without mentioning Hockey and uh, use some, some modification or some selection of the features. However, the system in, in almost all of the textbooks is kind of based conceptually on the original one proposed by Hockey. And we and I, uh, myself in particular, have problems with this. Uh, specifically, when it comes to language, to discussing language evolution, we think that it's not a very good place to start, as we argued some years back uh, in, a, in a biosynodics paper. And in that paper, we raised uh, two um, basic reservations against using uh, Hawke's design features system as a starting point in language evolution research. First of all, it's superficial and structuralist, and it focuses, it does not focus on the language user as an evolved biological being or biocultural being, but rather it focuses on the superficial properties of the code. And as a, partly as a consequence of that, it is not cognitive at all. So for example, uh, cognitive features related as pre prerequisites for evolving language. Uh, things such as mimesis, uh, parity requirement, perspective taking, memory capacity, uh, perhaps even recursion, right? But all of this is missing from Hockett's system because it doesn't focus on the cognitive layer. Right, but this is the, mm, and this is the, this is the language evolution context. What about animal communication context. When it comes to animal communication context, which the, the two of course are related. Hockey's design features, the system of Hockey's design features is still not great. I mean, we, we acknowledge its, um, its uh, place or its uh, importance as a classic and its descriptive value, but when it comes to the explanatory value, it also has problems. So first of all, it's obsolete, right? It's, it's uh, the, the first version, I think it's 63 years old now. And partly as a result, many features have become questionable. 
Uh, the first batch of features is uh, not used at all, almost, right? The, the features related to vocalization. That's not a problem, but the, the so-called more important features mm, are also getting suspect, like arbitrariness, for example, has been questioned as a design feature of language. There has been a, a recent excellent argument from Bodo Winter, uh, Winter that, that uh, arbitrariness is not really a design feature of language. It's more like a consequence. And this can be updated, right? And uh, we simply uh, might choose not to use arbitrariness, but it's there and kind of distracts. Yes, and many features are gradable, which results in partial matches. So in textbooks, uh, uh, one word that was used very, very frequently was limited. Like bees have some displacement, but it's limited. Right? Or have some productivity, but it's limited. Uh, when it comes to duality of patterning, textbooks have not got to, to, to that, but uh, we can say now about birds that maybe they have some duality of patterning, but it's limited, right? So maybe the features are not that, not that great, right? Because technically we can imagine a system of communication that would have checks on all of the, in all of the boxes and still be very far away from language because it would miss two key properties. If I'm about to... To, to talk um, to talk about on the not on this slide on the next one yeah so Hockett's system of design features is also anthropocentric and it's not very good for understanding animal systems communication systems for what they are because it's kind of conducing to understanding animal communication systems as kind of incomplete languages so languages that lack displacement, for example. It's not the best uh, vista into what uh, animal communication systems are because it does not use the tools that are designed for understanding animal communication systems. And the tools that are designed and that are used in the study of animal communication uh, are simply signaling theory. But signaling theory is not mentioned at all in textbooks. So uh, this might sound like uh, an argument of the type, your favorite theory is not discussed, right? But signaling theory is not really your favorite theory. It's, it's the theory that is, that is like the standard for, for discussing animal communication. So to me, at least, not using signaling theory in textbooks when you talk about animal communication is like discussing neurolinguistics without referring to, to brain anatomy. That's my perspective. And finally, on Hockett, one final thought on Hockett is that it misses the truly important features of language. One is open-ended semantics, and it's, it's different from just structural productivity uh, because it extends to what, what I call universality or, or domain generality. That in, in short, we can talk about anything. We don't have to talk about pollen, right? We can talk about anything. So a thematic or semantic domain <clears throat> sorry, domain generality. And the other very important feature of language is uh, through and through cooperativeness. So it's, so again, from the point of signaling theory, it's the feature of language that it's information donation, that it's kind of alt altruistic in terms of massively donating honest information. Uh, this would require some unpacking, so I'll just leave it there, but to some researchers with whom I agree, this is a deep design feature that underlies other features of language. Yes, so when it comes to the other, okay, when it comes to the other part of, or to the other um, major category that we coded for in our textbook, in, in textbooks, in our coding, uh, language origins and evolution, uh, we have um, a larger number of smaller reservations. And the first reservation is that pre-scientific content is discussed. And we had a discussion yesterday, and we agreed that it's not a problem per se that, uh, that pre-scientific content is mentioned, but rather the proportion of the total, total volume that is devoted to such topics. So divine origins and onomatopoeic theories, such as bow wow theory of language origins, poo poo theory, of language origins, these are kind of starting point for framing the discussion. But then if so, 
uh, I don't think it's it's okay to have like if you have 32 references to divine origins and only six to hominins, I think it's out of proportion. So my argument would be that it's time to move on, right? Okay. Next, there is some, but not much, incorrect information, information that we classified as incorrect. One example that we found in nine, in nine textbooks, uh, in nine textbooks, is that vocal tracts in non-human primates are incapable of producing speech sounds. And this is incorrect. As far as we are concerned, this has been falsified. It's not the vocal tract anatomy, it's uh, vocal tract innovation, right? So laryngeal laryngeo cortical connections. Uh, then there are some mentions that we find incorrect about Fox P2 and uh, a couple of others that are not that important, not that central, not that common. There is much more information, but still not, not a huge amount that we classified as misleading or outdated. So consider this example. These are just examples that are on the screen now. Most scientists agree there was probably some sort of linguistic big bang 50 to 100,000 years ago that resulted in a change in the structure of the brain, etc. We think it's false, but you know we, we can't prove it one way or the other, but uh, it's definitely misleading. Okay. And then we also have reservations against the organization informa of information in some of the textbooks. And the, the most glaring, glaring example is uh, Yule, which has a separate chapter on language origins, but it is very poorly organized. And why it's poorly organized is that it has the, uh, a number of sources, uh, what, what is called sources, the divine source, the natural sound source, musical source, etc. So from this very structure, it looks like these are kind of contenders or viable alternatives, right? And it's it's bad on two levels. Natural source is not a contender. It's some historical stuff. And then when it comes to, for example, the physical adaptation uh, or tool making and the human brain, and then genetic source, Right? These are not like alternatives, but these are just different levels, uh, Tinberg, Tinbergen's levels of description. Right, One is proximate and the other is ultimate, uh, I would say. Or one, is, uh, or one is specification, the other is implementation. So the organization here is, is bad. And uh, there, are more, there are more examples like this. One involves McGregor that I'll be happy to discuss if, uh, if there are questions about it. There were a number of uh, omissions, and I'm about to, to finish, but perhaps one more uh, minute. Uh, the most striking omission is cultural evolution, which is mentioned in just one textbook. It has three mentions. Social origins of language are not discussed uh, extensively. Um, so you can see the numbers, right, and in comparison, Chomsky. And uh, remember that we only coded researchers in fragments that were related to language evolution or animal communication. Turn-taking is not mentioned at all in these passages. There is, there is just one very brief mention of turn-taking as a possible language universal, right? And two other mentions that turn-taking is absent in apes. Fossil record, uh, four mentions, three textbooks. Uh, extinct hominins, okay, 15 mentions in six textbooks. Archaeology also not mentioned very uh, often. And that brings me to conclusions. And conclusions are as follows. Uh, language evolution research is not prominently represented in introductory linguistics textbooks, much less prominently than animal communication. There is a lot of variability in terms of how much is included and what specifically is included. And then generally, there is a lack of more current developments, uh, both for language evolution and animal communication. OK, what can you expect of textbook, you, textbooks? You can say. But we also noticed that subsequent editions of the most popular textbooks tend to kind of inherit stuff from older editions. And we really think it's time to move on. So thank you very much. This is the stupid slide that I always place at the end of any presentation. That's it. Thank you. <laughs>